welcome, Rob. I'm so happy to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you, Teresa. I appreciate you having me, and I'm really grateful to be here and excited to chat with you and the listeners. Oh, fantastic. Me too. Um, I, I first just want to start with um, kind of what drew you to the work you're doing now through Humans First? Yeah, so um, I would call the area of study that I that I do technology mindfulness, and that's something that I kind of came up with. It's not like a common term, right? Um, but I, you know, I went through high school, and I had a very difficult time during high school because I developed extremely bad acne. And so, what happened as a result of that is I had very low self esteem and self worth, and that was a very difficult time for me to connect with people and, you know, um, just relate to people in general. And you know, even one year for my yearbook picture, I purposefully didn't go because I just didn't want people to remember my face that way. Uh, but as a result of this acne, I also developed an addiction to video games. But this was in the mid 90s before most people even had a cell phone or had an internet connected computer. And so I saw before many people were even using technology, what were the negative impacts uh, or repercussions of technology in my own life. And then at other points in my life, I, I also was addicted to Facebook and addicted to email. And so I've kind of had this, uh, you know, like you were saying before, a love hate relationship with technology where you know, it it can do amazing things, but it can also be, um, we can also use it in ways that are kind of harmful. And so my mission at Humans First, my company, is to help humanity understand how technology impacts mental health, relationships, and productivity at work. And I truly believe that if all 4.2 billion people connected to the internet knew what I know about how technology impacts humanity, the world would be a completely different place. And that's why I'm excited to share this information with people. Yeah, it's so true. And and yeah, I also have a love-hate relationship with technology. And the thing is, when when I'm talking to people, and because I'm older, I you know, I do workshops. So I have a lot of very young people in the workshops. Mm. And I know that their first assumption or bias is that, oh, I don't, I don't get it because I'm quote old. And you know, I can't <laughs> I can't justify by saying, no, it's because I'm older, I get it. <laughs> it's, <laughs> but it's it it I was, I think I was the first person in my sphere of people, whatever that was back in the nineties that actually bought a personal computer. Like I, mm -hmm. I think there's so much good that can come out of technology. So the problem from my perspective is not the technology, it's mindless use. And it's the intention of the companies behind the technology that users are not understanding. And so I really want to hear what you think about this. There's so many things, the addictiveness of it and people not recognizing that it's designed that way, um, the loss of productivity and just the waste of life, you know, as far as the amount of time we're spending doing things on those little devices versus interacting with other people, which again, I know is a lot of your focus with uh, humans first, but can you just give me what your general thoughts are about this, you know, the direction we're heading and what you think about the impact is on us? Yeah, so I just want to be clear to the listeners and to you, right? So I'm not I'm not anti-technology. I'm pro-humanity. That's how I describe myself. And I, I am a nerd. I built my first computer in middle school. So I love technology. But um I, I view technology as a tool, right? And it, and just like any tool, it can be used for good or bad. So for instance, I can take a hammer and build a house, or I can take a hammer and hit you on the head. It's not the hammer that's bad, it's how I use it, right? And so I kind of think of technology as the same way. And, you know, here's kind of a quick exercise that I give for, you know, workshops or people that I'm working with. I say to people, just take 10 seconds, it shouldn't take long, think about the happiest moment in your life right? Whatever that is. I'll give you just a few seconds to think about it. And so when I ask people that question, a lot of times a couple of general themes come up, no matter who they are. The themes are that that happiest moment generally is an experience and not related to a material good or object. And then the other thing is that that experience uh, involves people, right? Usually the people in their life that they care about. And so when you think about that, none of those things have to do with technology, right? And, you know, I, I think very few people are ever going to be in their deathbed and wondering to themselves, oh, man, what if I had spent more time with technology? Instead, they're going to be wondering to themselves, man, I, I wish or I, I wanted to have spent more time with the people I cared about. And so, you know, the reason that I named my company Humans First is in America, and this is a pre-COVID statistic, this is not, you cannot say that COVID affected this. In America, we spend on average 12 hours and 21 minutes a day in front of screens and media. And so, you know, unfortunately, 
humans are not first in our life anymore. Technology is first based on how we spend our time. And so the name of my company, Humans First, is a reminder to people that the most love and joy and meaning and purpose in our lives comes from being with and connecting with other people, not technology. It's so true. Um, it, and I have to say, I am shocked. Now, I, I, I have to disclose I, I use technology every day. I'm using it right now, right? Me I think too. there are a lot of, you know, great things about technology and I use it all the time, but I do not use social media. I, it, it is such a rare thing. Our, the company does, I, but I don't do it because mm -hmm. the amount of time it takes versus the, the payoff is not worth it for me, but I understand in today's times we need to be on social media, right? We try mm -hmm. to use it mindfully, but I don't use social media. And I know I drive even my friends crazy because I also half the time don't know where my phone is. Like, you know, they'll, they'll say, I've been calling you for, you know, two hours. I'm like, I don't know where the phone is. I'll have to go find it. You know what I mean? Cause yeah. it's not, it's just not prominent in my life. It's a necessary mm. tool for work and for, you know, connecting with friends or whatever, but I'm connecting with them to, I don't know, determine a date or where we're going to meet. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm not using it to be the sole source of our, our relationship. And it disturbs me when I go out to lunch or out to dinner and I walk in now, most of my friends know if they leave their phone out, I'm going to get irritated, right? I don't want to hear, I don't have any notifications on except for phone, text, and calendar. That's it. Nice. All the other notifications are off. So nice. I can't stand being interrupted. Um, yeah. But I was going to say, when, I when you walk into a restaurant, there are couples or families and everybody, even though you're so tight at a restaurant table, they're all yeah. looking down at their phones instead of at mm -hmm. each other. So I, what do you think the impact is? Or I mean, I'm going to ask you a question you can't possibly say you know for sure, but I'm curious about the long-term impact on relationships with us putting that device between us instead of just connecting directly. Oh, so I'll I'll, I'll give you a couple different uh, pieces of information that I think are very relevant. So these researchers, these psychologists did a study on what happens when a smartphone is present. And so here's what they found. If like, like let's say you and I are at a dinner table, even if I put my smartphone face down and turned off between us, right? Like it's still visible. The feelings of trust, closeness, and um, connection are reduced between us, even if it's turned off and face down, right? And so what's happening is you, and this is all like subconscious, right? It's not like you're, you don't like, this probably doesn't enter your mind, but like when this device is in front of you, you are devoting, I'll just call it brain cycles to thinking about what could be in this device or what could I, do I have to check it? Who's trying to get a hold of me, right? Like you're subconsciously thinking that. And instead, and so that takes me out of the present and out of the conversation with you. So that, you know, that is already proven, like that's not, you know, a debate, right? And, but think about how many millions of people that's impacting, you know, around the world when they, you know, have a cell phone out on the, on the dinner table. But here's another thing that is really interesting that I think is, um, has far more implications for, uh, for honestly, the 4.2 billion people connected to the internet. So I'm sure as a psychologist, you're aware that when you connect with people in person, chemicals that are released are serotonin and oxytocin. And those are the chemicals that make us feel loved and needed and wanted and supported, right? And warm human touch and in-person connection releases the most serotonin and oxytocin. Well, as you go toward more digital ways of communicating like email and text, less serotonin and less oxytocin are released. And so our feelings of social support and care and love are less. They're diminished when we use digital communication. And I legitimately, and so um, one of the main ways that humans deal with stress is our social support system, our feeling of, you know, being cared for by other people like our family or close friends. Well, I truly believe that one of the main reasons, one of the main contributors to the mental health crisis today is that because almost all our communication is going digital and is, and nothing, almost nothing is in person anymore. Um, there's less serotonin and oxytocin released in our relationships, and therefore we have a less perceived social support, which means that we are less able to tolerate or deal with stress. And I think that this is a huge contributor to what's happening to our mental health crisis. I really believe that. Yeah, that's fascinating. And and I would agree. Um, I think that's, well, I hoped that one thing people would see out of the pandemic shutdowns is what happens when you can't connect personally. And of course it did have a huge mental health impact, but I'm not seeing a decrease in usage now. 
<laughs> so I'm assuming right. that lesson didn't quite translate. Um, it, it, well, there's so many aspects to this. It's hard to even narrow it down, but there is, what, yeah. Uh, and and my listeners know anytime I get on this topic of technology, it's like, oh, but, um, <laughs> you know, one of the things that I wonder about, so I know for me, um, there's a tremendous social pressure to use it mm -hmm. or to be on social media specifically, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, it it's assumed there's something wrong with you, right? Like, why aren't you on Facebook? Why aren't you on Instagram? Why aren't you on TikTok? Like all of those things. And I now it's easy for me to say, and again, probably because I'm older and I'm confident in what I'm doing, and I and I have the science behind it to understand why it's not the healthiest thing for me. But I'm I think there's a lot of people that maybe do feel that, like especially younger people, peer pressure. Like if they're not on, then how are they going to connect with all the other people that are on? And I'm wondering if if you have any thoughts about that as far as the impact on young people that are on it all the time, but also those that are feeling that peer pressure and and they don't necessarily want to be on it. Yeah. So it's interesting, right? Um, you know, I wrote a blog post <laughs> entitled eight reasons why social media is the cigarette of the 21st century. And I truly like, this is one of the most strongly held beliefs I have about all this entire technology mindfulness topic. I truly believe that in 20 years, we're going to say to ourselves, what on earth were we thinking giving 12 year olds a cell phone with unlimited use to social media? That's totally bonkers. It doesn't even make any sense, but we don't, we just don't realize it right now, how, how terrible it really is. Um, for people psychologically. And so what's interesting about social media is, uh, you know, people experience FOMO or a fear of missing out when they're on it. But then based, I also agree with what you just said, they experience FOMO when they're off it, right? Because they're like, well, if I'm not on social media, I feel like I'm missing out on those things. And I guess the thing that I would say to people is you just have to realize that um, you're not missing out on things you just have to think differently about how you communicate with people. So, you know, in this day and age, there's a, just a, an unlimited number of ways to connect with people, right? Even just, let's say, text message, which, you know, isn't as fancy as social media. There's not, you know, it's harder to do photos and everything, but you can still do it. And I, but, but what I would really say is instead of social media, why don't you actually go back to what we used to do, like call people or see them in person, because you will develop a much better relationship with people that way. And, you know, here's kind of the challenge that I offer people in America, the average person spends 12, uh, two hours and 14 minutes a day on social media. And if you're younger, it's probably way greater, right? Like probably four to five hours for a lot of young people. And so what I suggest, or I guess the challenge I give to people is this, Let's just pretend for a second that you cut your time in half. I'm not saying you get rid of social media. I'm just saying you cut your social media time in half and then take that time that you spent that you can now have free and spend that with people either in person or on the phone. How much better your relationships will be and how much happier you are and how much more fulfillment you will get out of your life is so much greater. It just takes slightly more effort and it isn't as convenient as social media, but that's, that's okay. Um, you know, it, it still is such a great, you know, amazingly different change to your life. And it's so positive. I, I really have found that to be helpful for me. Yeah. I mean, it, it may not be as convenient, but it's much more valuable and you know, th there's a trade-off there. Um, I know that you have talked about this um, before, but maybe just so they don't hear, my listeners don't keep hearing me say sort of the same thing. But can you talk a little bit about the addictiveness of especially the social media platforms, or at least some of them? Yeah, well, think about this, right? So I think in order to understand this, you the listeners really have to understand what is the business model of the social media companies or any media company. It's not just social media. It's actually all news media companies, right? The business model is this. I want to show you as much anger-inducing, fear-inducing, or anxiety-inducing content as possible because it maximizes your time on my platform. The more time of yours that I get or maximize on the platform, the more um, advertising dollars I can get and the more money I make. And the reason if, if I'm Facebook that I want to, for instance, show you negative or anger-inducing content is 
in humans, we have a negativity bias, as I'm sure you know. And so we are much, we pay much closer attention to negative information than positive because it's a survival mechanism. And so it's not a surprise that negative information gets more eyeballs, keeps more people on platforms longer, and makes the uh, social media companies more money. So think about it, you are essentially being put into a negative mindset or a negative emotional state because that makes more money off of your time and attention. And that is why the, the, the Facebook is showing you that information. So now, now that you know that the, the Facebook's main goal is to monopolize your time and attention, think about this. So uh, what Mark Zuckerberg and all the other social media companies do is they hire tens of thousands of people, tens of thousands of engineers to figure out using their their knowledge, but also supercomputers, how to monopolize your time and attention as much as possible. And so how is one single human brain going to possibly resist the efforts of tens of thousands of engineers and supercomputers to that is trying to make something very addicting? The answer is it's not. Your brain isn't. It's just not a winning battle that you can really expect to reasonably, uh, you know, come out ahead on. And so for me, the, 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 you know, the solution that I've chosen is to delete social media completely from my phone, not delete my accounts, but what I have to do then to use social media is to use it only on my computer or laptop which forces me to be much more uh, intentional or mindful about its use. And I still get the benefits, but I'm not so inclined to just look at it all the time when I'm on my phone. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I don't have it on my phone either anymore. I took it off a few years ago. And part of it is, and it goes back to this addictive quality, I think, but I've known for a long time. And even before I knew, you know, before there were real studies, there were, uh, there were anecdotal, there was anecdotal information that caught my attention. Like this makes sense. I don't think I want to go down this rabbit hole. Yeah. And, and so I thought I was exempt. Like, I don't, I don't check my phone 200 times a day, you know, whatever the numbers were at the time and, yeah. and then discovered, yes, I did. Um, I was at a, a writer, writer's retreat with no internet access and I kept picking up my phone. And that's when I realized uh... like, oh my gosh. You know? mm -hmm. So that's when I came home, took it all off my phone. Um, I, I occasionally go in, I have accounts too. I just, I occasionally go in on, in my personal accounts, but only on the computer yep. and never if I'm working because, oh my gosh, the productivity sap <laughs> mm -hmm. that happens once you start. It's is, so unbelievable. It's, it's amazing how much time people, I mean, and I do a lot of, again, workshops and, you know, I'm working with teams that are complaining they don't have enough time to get their work done. And so the minute I start to go down this avenue of, well, how much how much are you using your phone during the day? How many times are you checking your social media? I mean, there's a lot of resistance to it and I understand it, but mm -hmm. it's like, you really have to be in control, not just because of the time, but because of the addictiveness. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we get a hit of dopamine, right? When we get mm -hmm. a like, or somebody says something positive, whereas we also go down the stress response path when somebody says something awful, mm -hmm. but that, that little hit is so powerful, which I think people underestimate. I don't even read our reviews of workshops. I have staff do it. I don't ever want the feedback directly that, that I see like, oh, it was great because I don't want to base what I'm doing on that feedback because it's uh, a drug, right? It's a, it's uh -huh. a, it's a hit of, oh, I feel good now. I want it to be realistic and I want them to give me the feedback that's constructive, but I don't read the actual, you know, people make say lovely comments. I have my staff read it so that I don't, don't go down that path even without the technology. So- uh -huh. How do you counteract it or what do you think you can do to counteract it other than minimizing your exposure to it? Because that's been obviously my path, but. Well, I think, I mean, I mean, there's so many, there's so many <laughs> ways to answer that question, but I think what you really have to ask yourself is what is important to you in your life? You know, because again, let's say you're using social media five hours a day, right? Again, that's a, that's probably okay. a pretty average young person. Uh, that's literally almost a full-time job. That's seven days a week, five hours a day. That's 35 hours a week, literally almost a full-time job. And so you have to ask yourself, I mean, is, 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 is making Z Mark Zuckerberg more rich really that important to you? Is that really what is, you know, you're here to do? 
uh, you know, um, if you think about humans, right, I, I think a lot about how did humans exist 50,000 years ago when we were cavemen and cave women. There, there was three th main things that humans did. We hunted, we gathered, and we socialized. And 90% of our time as cavemen and cave women was spent socializing with other people, right? And that ratio is almost exactly flipped today. Now we're spending close to 90% of our waking hours with technology. And so you kind of have to ask yourself, like, well, certain, you know, almost anything in our life as a species has to help us with one or two things, help us survive or help us reproduce. Technology doesn't inherently do either one of those things, right? And so it, it, it makes it like makes logical sense that if we're doing this thing for almost the entire day that doesn't inherently help us as a species, that's probably going to have some negative repercussions over the long term, maybe not in the short term, but in the long term, it probably will. And so like, these are the kind of things that I'm just trying to help people to start thinking about and be aware of, because, you know, if you don't have awareness of these things, you can't change your behavior. And so the, really the main thing I, I think you can start doing is to educate yourself about these things. And that's why a big, you know, a big component of what Humans First does is just simply educate people on these things, because most people they're not thinking about these things and they're not obsessed with them like I am, <laughs> um, which is fine. They don't have to be. But that's that's why I'm, I'm I really want to share this information with people so that they can start being aware. Yeah. And, you know, that's the whole key with mindfulness in anything that we do. And that's what I was saying at the beginning is I just think people, they're not, they're not being aware. They're not recognizing because there are bigger ramifications even now with the misinformation that's rampant in uh, technology. And now mm -hmm. that the AI stuff that's happening, you know, the, what are they, the deep fakes where you yeah. don't even know if the person you're looking at online Real? is that person or somebody else because they've gotten so sophisticated. And so it's not, it's not a matter of, again, never going on your device or never going on the internet. We all do all the time, but it's a matter of being very aware or even I'm, I always enter it a little bit skeptical, like mm. who, where's the source or where is this coming from? Because we yeah. don't know anymore. And I think that's another thing that's hard for people to kind of wrap their heads around. Mm -hmm. It started out innocently enough, maybe, but they now don't realize that there are a lot of uh, people who have malcontent, you know, they, they their, their intentions are not to make the world a better place or to help an individual. It's to gain something for themselves only. And, you know, we just have to be realistic about it and pay attention, but it's- well, is it yeah, it's, in it's interesting you say that, right? So there's a um, an author called Wynn, and he wrote a 40-page white paper on Twitter and like the gamification of Twitter. And he's like an expert in uh, echo chambers and the ga gamification of things or game theory. And what he basically concluded is that um, Twitter and other social media platforms are essentially the most ideal environment to create a cult of people that, you know, and obviously cults, some cults can be positive, but a lot of cults are for, you know, have negative ramifications. And he basically showed that like, this is like the ultimate tool that can be used. And a lot of this unfortunately happens for like a lot of political issues. Right. And again, like, I don't, I don't, just to be clear, I don't affiliate with any particular political party. So like, I'm not, I don't have a horse in that race, but it's just more the fact that, you know, there are people being manipulated into believing some political stance again, one way or the other on the aisle, doesn't matter. That is probably not true or is based on false information. And, and these so social media platforms are the perfect tool to do that. And so again, like if every, I wish every person on earth knew that because then way less of them would probably be susceptible to falling into those, you know, those echo chambers, but that's not, you know, what's unfortunately what is happening. You know, a lot of people are getting sucked in. No, I, yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and it's again, another example that, as you mentioned earlier, it's, that it's not just social media, it's all news platforms. So it's, we don't really get unbiased news hardly anywhere anymore. You have to mm -hmm. really be mindful about the information that you're consuming mm -hmm. and not just get sucked into something. And it's really easy to do it because like you said, they're very skilled at this. The technology is such and the psychologists and engineers behind it. And these companies also hire lots of psychologists, not just the engineers that are programming because right. they, they really are tying it to our intrinsic behavior and the brain chemicals that we have no control over, you know, that happen instantaneously and they're taking advantage of it a lot of times, but it's mm -hmm. just, I don't know. It's just the craziest thing I've ever, I, I'm amazed every week at something I see or hear and think, what are, why are we going down this road? Like, it just doesn't make sense to me sometimes. Um, 
I know another area that, because you do uh, work a lot with productivity, improving productivity. So there are obvious uh, things we can change about technology, which we can talk about in a minute for productivity. But I know you're also a proponent of the four-day work week. So I was yeah. wondering if you could tell me what are the benefits of that? Yeah, so my my consultancy helps entire companies transition from a five day work week to a four day work week with no loss in productivity or profitability. And just to be clear, when I say a four day work week, I mean four eight hour days, not four 10 hour days. And so we're not, you know, like every person in the company, management included, gets a full day of time back. And so you might think to yourself, like, the, the, you know, the, t the common two questions are, well, like, how can this be possible? How can I do five days of work in four days? And then what about like my clients? They need five days of coverage. And, um, you know, really, if you think about what's happening in the modern workday, the average white collar worker sends and receives 126 emails and um, emails, and then they check their emails in Slack once every six minutes. Um, and by the way, so if you're doing 126 emails a day and you take two minutes per email, that's literally four hours of your day right there. Then if you layer in a couple hours of meetings, that's six hours of your day. You only have two hours left to do your job. I mean, that's not realistic for most people. So it really is possible to reduce some email and reduce meetings and, you know, get all this time back. And, you know, some of there's just some incredible, incredible benefits that companies can experience. So, um, you know, turnover goes way down. So you have way lower recruiting costs, employee engagement and happiness goes way up. Um, then you have the ultimate recruiting tool, right? Less than 1% of US companies are offering this. And so if you have this insane employee benefit that less than 1% of companies offer, you can retain and attract the most rock star employees in your industry. And so what does that do to the value of your company? That that makes it exponentially bigger, right? Um but the other thing is people also don't think that profitability can go up, but uh, um, one of the most famous uh, cases is Andrew Barnes took a 240 person financial services company in 2018, and he took it to a four day work week and profit per employee increased 14 and a half percent. And so, I mean, a lot of people hear this and they almost think it's too good to be true, right? Like, you know what, like, how is this possible? But it really is. You just have to have a little bit of an open mind and be willing to change how you're doing some things, but it really isn't that hard. Yeah. Well, and I find it ironic that all we heard for decades was technology was going to save us time and we wouldn't have to work as much. And instead it's the technology that's extending our work hours. And <laughs> so yes. I, I totally agree. When I, um, you know, I do a couple of things. I, I'm a productivity freak, I know, but I, um, I'm i very regimented. I'm very, very relaxed and free will outside of work, but with work, it's very regimented. So everything's on my calendar. I check my emails at certain times of the day. I I, I have it. breaks in my calendar. I have movement breaks in my calendar so I don't sit too long. So you know, everything is scheduled. And then when that schedule's nice. done, I'm done, right? But what I found when I first switched, at first I was just working like I've always worked and checking email throughout the day. And and I started really oh. focusing on this interruption problem and how long mm -hmm. it would take me to get back on track. And so when I got very regimented and I, and you know, you have to let people know when you're making a big change. And it was like, you can email me. And this goes back to also this instant gratification thing with texts mm -hmm. and emails and social media. It's like, I, I do remember the day where, you know, we could go hours without communicating with someone else. <laughs> and so I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm going to check it at eight o'clock, 12 o'clock, four o'clock. So if you email me, I'll get back to you, but it may be a while. But what happened is my, I was working maybe five 30 in the morning till five 30 in the evening every day. Mm. And when I made this switch, it dropped to like at two o'clock in the afternoon, I was done. I I'd yes. finished my work. Right. <laughs> and so that yeah. was like my there was my big motivation to, okay, I have to stick with this because what's happening yeah. is the diversions and the emails and the text messages and everybody wanting something right now was preventing me from really, especially my work. I'm writing, it's creativity, it's it's research. Every time you get interrupted, you, you're starting over from scratch, basically, right? You got to go back yep. to something you've already done and get that momentum back. So um, I can see why a, a four-day work week would work if you set it up right. I mean, that's really all it comes down to. You boundaries and, you know, processes.
Yeah, I'd, I'd love to put some numbers in exactly what you just said. And by the way, I'm like super impressed with you, Teresa. And <laughs> it sounds like you're already doing a lot of the things that I would advocate for a normal, like an average person. So I really, I think that's really cool that you've come to that conclusion. What, the hard and, way. <laughs> and I was the same way, right? Like I thought it was super productive and I, and I, but I would, I would get to the end of a day and I would say to myself, like, what did I really accomplish? And the list that I could write of things I accomplished was very small, very small. And so here's what's happening, Right. Um, so um, researchers did some um, some uh, research on when people get in flow, right? When you're just having it like in this amazingly productive state, uh, you can be up to 500% more productive. So two hours in flow is better than an entire day without flow, right? So, but here's the problem. When people are in flow and they get interrupted, and that could be as some, but something by as simple as a phone call or an email, when they get interrupted, it takes them 26 minutes to get back into flow. Well, we check our email and Slack once every six minutes on average, you get a smartphone notification once every 15 minutes on average. So you can see that the average person is never, ever in flow. They're never getting into this flow state where they're 500% more productive. And so if you can block off just two or three hours of your day and eliminate all distractions, and I'm saying like everything, um, which is easier said than done, but it really isn't that hard then you can get into this flow state and literally get more done in two hours than an entire day before and work actually less than four days a week. Like you were saying, you, you know, you cut about, it sounds like you cut about three hours per day off, yeah. you know, that times five days a week, that's 15 hours. That's two work days. Right. 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 You know, that's, yeah. that's exactly what's possible. Back when I read Tim Ferriss's book, the four day work week is the first time I had come up with or seen this concept. And I was like, is that possible? Is that possible? <laughs> I started really <laughs> looking at things and like, and then of course it took me a while to get around to doing it. Cause like many people, first I read a great idea and then I set it aside, but yeah, it's uh, it makes a huge difference. And the quality of work, um, I know for me and I and for my staff, I think I can speak for them too. And they're younger. What happens when you're trying to really say flesh out an idea or this could be, this is true with a lot of our leaders that um, we coach. They've got a, it could be something like trying to develop the next year's budget or the strategic plan. It, there's a lot of different processes happening in the mind, right? Trying to keep track of all the moving parts, evaluate the past, look at the future. And something as simple as a stupid notification on the phone going off, because I, I challenge anyone to not, at least for one split second, look over to see what that was. Right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then, so like you said, you set yourself back 26 minutes. Well, if you, if you do that five times in a day, you, your accomplishment list is not going to be very long because you can't finish or you kind of then go, okay, whatever. And you rush through because it's due, but it's not, not necessarily a, a quality product that you end up with at the end. And I think I can't say his name, the psychologist that wrote the book flow, but when you're in that state of flow, which is a psychological state, it is time, time stops. It mm -hmm. doesn't even exist anymore. When I'm writing, I'm working on a book right now. When I'm writing and right. can get into flow. Now I will end up maybe working for 10 hours, but it feels like two, but it's, yes. it's joyful work. It's like, Oh, I nailed that. I got that. You know what I mean? And you just keep going and going. And I think so many people aren't experiencing that ever. And that's no. part of why employee engagement is so low because there's like, I've got to go to work. And you know, they, they, there's no meaning in it because it just feels like you're hopping all day and you're not kind of delving into something worthwhile. But. Yeah. And it's, it's really interesting you say that. So uh, two, two quick comments. The first one is the reason that I um, have come to these conclusions about how to structure technology use in a way that's helpful is I probably should have mentioned this earlier. I have ADHD, right? And so it's way easier for me than the average person to get distracted. And so I realized that I was getting distracted all the time. And, you know, it was, um, it was happening so often that I was like, oh my God, this is not, this is really hard to, you know, for me to accomplish anything. So the good news is that if I, a, a guy with ADHD can, you know, structure my tech use in a way that is helpful to me, that makes my life easier instead of harder, you know, anybody can do it. Right. And that's why I'm, and so I've run hundreds and hundreds of experiments over the last few years to, you know, try different things and techniques and ways to structure my tech use to, in order to come to the conclusions that I have today, which is, you know, I, I feel like that's pretty helpful. But it was, what another thing that's interesting that you brought up is um, people when they when 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 um, researchers look at what you know if if they ask people if did you have a good day at work today 
and people say yes. The number one thing most highly correlated with yes, I had a good day at work was making meaningful progress in something that matters. And so if you are constantly interrupted by everything, right, email, Slack, phone, you're really not making probably much meaningful progress in something that's, you know, that's, uh, you know, important. And so by uh, it seems very counterintuitive, but by single tasking, eliminating distractions and focusing, not only do you have a higher quality product, you get more done, but you're actually happier at work and you feel more fulfilled because you're making meaningful progress in something. It's such a win. It is such yeah. a win. Yeah, no, it's it, it. I'm always fascinated with it because we think we don't have any control over our mind and we don't always recognize the connection between what our mind is doing and our level of happiness. Um, but it's once you hit it, and I'm going to ask you this question because I know time flies. Um, I'm going to ask you a question about this in just a moment. But I wanted to say this is a good example um, of what I'm hearing a lot now, which is people that are now still working from home and they're yeah. having a terrible time with with distractions. So whether yeah. somebody else lives at the house or you know whatever's going on. And so I just want to share that, and this is kind of a use of technology, but I got so tired of people coming. I am in a separate room. I had to do that during the pandemic, move out of the house because I got interrupted too much. Yeah. But I'm in a separate room. But then they come to the door and they'll like do this at the glass, right? Put their hands up and look in the glass, which is just as distracting as if they just came in. So I ended up ordering a light and I ordered a, a little adapter that makes the light remote controlled. And nice. it's, it's out there. And every time, like now, I just click the light on and everyone now understands if the light is on, do not come near the door. And all technology is off that I'm not using. And mm -hmm. that allows me to focus on you. It allows me to focus on, you know, what, what I'm thinking of. So I just wanted to throw in one positive technology thing that can help. And especially if you're working at home and struggling with this. So love that. Yeah. I mean, and, and you, you just brought up something that I, um, I think is really the root cause of a lot of the problems that people experience is. The average company that I talk to, almost none of them have established written standards of communication or communication boundaries. They're not written. E even if you think you have them and you just tell employees something, if they're not written, they don't exist, right? And the, here's the problem with that is if you do not have written guidelines or boundaries, every person at the company is just forced to guess how, when, and how much they need to communicate. So not only does this guessing, you know, duplicate efforts and make things way less efficient, but it also creates a ton of stress that's unneeded. And so if you communicate, you know, if you communicate this to, you know, the communication boundaries to employees, then they know, oh, for instance, like, here's an example of what this might sound like. Uh, you know, we believe that communication should be handled between business communication should be handled between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. local time. We expect that all business emails will be answered within 24 business hours and email is generally used for external communication. We believe that Slack is used for mostly internal communication and that any Slack messages will be uh, answered within three business hours. If there's something that requires more urgency than three hours, you will Slack call someone else and we will try do our best to return Slack calls as immediately as possible. So imagine if all that was communicated to not only the employees, but the clients of a company. Now, instead of checking your email once every six minutes, like the average person does, you can check your email once or twice a day and just respond. And then you have the rest of the day to focus and do whatever it is you need to do. And it's not that is like such a simple step, but almost no company has done that. No, no. And that's amazing. And and again, this it's, it's, we're, we're really talking about the same thing, which is not just boundaries, but understanding how the brain works. And th those companies are going to have more productive employees if they do that simple thing, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it, it is hard to communicate it. I, I, it's a challenge. And that kind of brings me to what I said I was going to ask you, which is if an individual, regardless of whether it's, you know, they work for a company or they own a company or whatever it is, but if an individual is recognizing that they might be overwhelmed with technology, I'm a big proponent of baby steps, like starting small so that the change sticks and then you can keep building on it. So could you give our listeners maybe a couple, three baby steps that they could take starting today, like right after they listen to this, to start lessening that overwhelm and getting more control back over their time and productivity and their mental health? 
Totally. Yeah. I mean, three super easy things and each one of these will take a couple minutes. The first one that you can do is, um, if, especially if you have an iPhone, the setting is called raise to wake. You can disable the raise to wake setting. And what that setting does is when you pick up your phone and physically move it, it automatically turns on the display so that you can see whatever it is, is on the display. So if you turn that feature off, not only does it save battery life, which, you know, most people want that, but the other thing is then your phone screen doesn't automatically turn on. You either have to double tap the display or hit the power button to sh see what's on it. And it, it sucks you in your phone way less, way, way less. And there's a similar setting on Android too. So that to me is like, literally you can do that in 20 seconds. And that massive, I found that when I did that, it reduced my screen time by a couple hours a week. Just that one thing right there, mm -hmm. right? Then the next thing would be, um, I always kind of like to call it spring cleaning for your phone. You know, when you have, it's like so easy to add an app because most apps are, you know, free, um, but you really don't use a lot of them. And and even though it, it seems like there's not a cost to having the app because it's free, there is a cost because you're overwhelmed with the amount of crap on your phone, right? <laughs> it would be like trying to find something in a super messy room versus a really, really clean and organized room. It's just harder in the messy room. And so the second thing that I would recommend to people is just take a few minutes, go through your phone, delete any apps you haven't used in a while. The metric that I kind of use for myself is if I haven't used an app in three months, I delete it. And that, you know, has served me pretty well. And it keeps the amount of apps down on my phone. It also saves space and kind of helps your phone run probably a little faster. Um, the third thing that you could do is go to the notifications section of your settings and disable almost all notifications. And like you said earlier, I really love Teresa that you said that you've disabled almost everything. The ones that I, I I've disabled all notifications except for phone calls, text messages, uh, and travel apps just so that I know if my flight's delayed or something, but everything else is, is, um, is, uh, uh not enabled for any kind of notification. And what's interesting is 85% of people have not ever altered their notifications on their phone, which yeah. blows my mind. So the, the vast majority of you listening probably haven't done this, and this will dramatically save the amount of, you know, notifications and interruptions that you get from your phone. And it will just be a game changer for you. That's amazing. 85%. Yeah. I don't even keep now I'm about to take a trip. So I'll turn on, turn on the notifications for my travel, travel app. Yeah. <laughs> but I keep everything off because you can still go in. I think that's the other thing is the key to me behind all of this is it's not that you never can use any of these wonderful, you know, apps or technology. It's that it's switching it so that you're in charge of when you do it versus it being in charge of when it pulls you in. And so you can, it's not hard to turn those apps on it. I mean, the notifications on and off at all. It's just a little right. swipe. Um, and so, yeah, I keep, I, again, I keep mine off and my phone is on do not disturb half the time. So mm -hmm. I get very few of those kind of interruptions. I still have the, the human kind, but not the technology <laughs> kind. So, well, I just want to thank you so much. And if people want to know more about uh, the work that you're doing, is there a website they can go to? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. My website is humansfirst.us. And one other thing that I just wanted to offer the listeners, Teresa, is a free 30-minute consultation call with me. So if people want to redeem that, all they have to do is just email me. Um, my email address is rob, R-O-B, at humansfirst.us. And then just mention this podcast in the subject line, and I'm happy to set up a 30-minute call to help you with your technology mindfulness. Lovely. Oh, that's great. Okay, well, I'll repeat that too uh, in a little while just to make sure they have it. And I, I just want to thank you so much. I greatly appreciate the work you're doing. I think it's so needed. And I hope people listening, even if there's just a little niggle, like, oh, could that be me? Then check it out because you could really greatly improve the quality of your life. I think if you just followed this sort of path of, I don't know, taking advantage of the best of technology, but keeping it within control so that you're in the driver's seat. So I just thank you so much. Thank you, Teresa. I really appreciate you. Mm -hmm.